you want to find your tribe of raving fans, I'm going to help you do it. This is the Digging Deep Podcast with 360 Media, where we help you do better business. Hey everybody, this is Justin Lamb, and this is episode four of Digging Deep, where we help business owners build better businesses. Today I'm here with an amazing individual who has a very interesting story. Started off as a bike messenger and worked his way into the ecosystem of couriership and now is one of the fastest growing logistics and courier companies here in Vancouver. Welcome, Mark Huggin. Hey, Justin, how's it going? Hey, Good thank you. you, thank you. Um, so I'm super interested in, um, in the journey and I think a lot of people are interested in, you know, humble beginnings and how it all goes. So, you know, maybe why don't we talk about like where the idea of Phantom started? It wasn't my idea. I was working in, I was like in between jobs kind of thing. I bought a house in Kitsilano with Tanya. I was married to Tanya. We were just, I was doing construction things. And then I ended up having to move my painting studio. I had a painting studio at my house on West 11th to downtown, which I thought would be good. And I, uh, I needed to get a job. Like, and I saw my friend Shane, he was quitting his job as a courier. So I yelled at him, hey, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm going to California. I was like, oh, what do you do for work? I'm a courier. I said, could I have your job? So he just gave me his job. So I started working for a company called International Parcel Service, and I had a good mentor named Blake Cripwell. And uh, I worked for him, and I really liked him. But I was using it to my advantage. I'd sit in the IPS office. I'd go out and do my work. I'd come back. I'd read books. I'd go across the street to my studio. I'd paint. I had a pretty much like life of Riley. I was, you know, do whatever I wanted, make money, painted, red books. Then on one day, this woman jumps out in front of my bike and says, hey, can you do this? And I was like, yeah, five bucks. And it was, it was like, I've told the story a million times. It's like, I don't know if that was actually the spark that set it going, but I ended up going to Kinko's and I made a flyer, marked the courier, slipped it under doors, got a pager and it just took off. Well, it didn't really take off. I remember talking to other independent bike messengers, the internet just started and uh, there was other guys and I remember being at triple five Hastings and this guy JF and he's like when you've got 30 clients you, you'll make it and I said I've got like two and uh, it was a struggle but it was fun and I really liked it I liked the hustle I liked the camaraderie of the the bike messengers you know I, I really knew the independent guys more than the employee guys they, they come and go they zip around I see them all the time they're crushing it but the indie guys we all sort of like how did you do it I made my rates this way. We were kind of like a small, nobody knew anything group of guys who had a businesses that suddenly needed to put out rates and billing and invoice. I didn't even know when I handed my first bill to a client, they're like, this is a statement, not an invoice. I'm like, great. You know, I don't know that I don't know that. So I came from it totally like open-minded and creative and I didn't even know what I didn't know. It was pretty good. It was great, you know. So that's my, that's the, the, the spark day. And so how does that evolve? Like, so you hand in your first set of invoices or <laughs> yeah. statements and, now they, and then you go and climb and create this monster. I mean, you were what, fastest growing company in 20... 18? 2018, yeah. Yeah, and we were before too. Like yeah. we've done it twice, which is good because we are just, we are not some, you know, glass, ivory, t we're not a big glass tower business. We're just a crunching numbers company that measures our growth. Like um, one of the things that we, you and I have in common is how much fun it is with numbers. You know, that's the good thing. So it's just, it's grown day by day, hour by hour, trip by trip, moment by moment. I mean, really, it is an existential company. Mm. And so I think one of the biggest things I think in, in your success um, is the dashboards. Uh, I meet very few people who I could send a text message to um, asking questions about their business and getting a an answer back with a definitive number. Uh, and, and that's all part and parcel of you creating a dashboard that you get to see every day to see, you know, what's going on and how it's comparable to years, months, days beforehand. And so how did you create something like that? It's not my idea. So I'm lucky. I worked... First, my first thing with dashboards was I worked at Earl's Restaurants and uh, Earl's on top on Robson Street on the big walk-in cooler. They had a PARS chart. And so, of course, I asked, uh, I think it was Merriman or something, some manager there, what is this? Because I had no need to know. Like, no need to know. You don't need to know what this is. 
And uh, he told the kitchen manager, the kitchen manager told the front of house manager, they're like, Huggin wants to know what this is. Should we tell him? And of course they told me. And as soon as I found out, I was like, I love this. And it was, um, I think it was like Mother's Day. The PARS chart said, this is how Mother's Day has performed the last five years at Earl's. This is how much staff we need. This is how much of the sauces we need. This is how much extra staff we'll need. And I'm like, that's brilliant. You know, I'm thinking at home. I'm like, this is like when I pack to go on vacation, this is how many socks you'll need. This is how many t-shirts you'll need. What's the weather look like? It's just like, it just became like a culture in my head. Then I forgot. And you know, I forgot everything because you always do. And then uh, my business was in the, just, it was chaos. You know, I didn't know anything. It was growing too fast. I was walking through a uh, Vancouver board of trade business after business thing. And I hear, Hogan, is that you? And I look around, I was like, what? I don't recognize anybody, but I like gravitate to the biggest guy. I'm like, it must be that guy. And it's Rich Scott and he's a business coach. And I like to describe Rich Scott as like 10 feet tall, you know, jacked, Brooks Brothers suit, you know, pink tie, black eye kind of guy. It's like stands out in the crowd, like super good. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, how's Phantom? Do you remember me? And I'm, he knows I don't. I got the blank stare on my face like, ah, uh, so overwhelmed, right? Just overwhelmed. Just at another event, overwhelmed again, again, again. And he invites me to uh, a lunch meeting. And he tells me, what's your three big problems? And I'm like, well, you know, accounts receivable, CRA, and payroll, like every other business person. I turn around here, I get punched in the face. I go over here, I get punched in the face. I go over there, I get punched in the face. He's like, you need my help. He gives me the bill. And I'm like, it's like, like 500 bucks a week. It's like 1998 or something. It's like maybe 99. It was a lot of money. I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. I can't afford it. He's like, you can't afford it, or you won't afford it, or you don't want to afford it. Like he gave me all those traditional sales things. I was like, if I don't do something, I'm toast, whatever. So then the first thing we did is we made, he showed me another dashboard. I'm like, this is like Earl's. Oh yeah, super successful business Earl's. Business coach, he's giving me the thing. He's like, you want clarity and you want to see things clearly, get a dashboard. So we started monkeying around with dashboards. Super easy Excel spreadsheets at first, then you tweak them, you make them colorful, you make them function, you take out what's not important. At first they had everything that wasn't important, you know, like. How many hours of skateboarding can I do after work? And you know, <laughs> you know, just dumb things like how much time do I spend on the phone? Which Starbucks did I go to? Like, and then now it's just strictly, it's it's rad. I love it. And it's I talked about it with my operations manager yesterday. I was like, this is what we've got. If we don't pay attention to the dashboard, we might as well just jump in the car with no gas and head for the mountains and just be like, oh, what happened? Of course we didn't look. Hmm. So yeah, I live by them and I've got them for so many different parts of the company. Like I put them in everything now. Like you do. It's fun. It is so much fun. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's interesting. Um, when you're able to measure and compare, you kind of know what's what lies ahead and what's what you've passed. And, and sometimes, yeah. especially when you're, when you're this close to it, it's really hard to understand, you know, how far you've come. I mean, less than 10 years ago, we were in a BNI chapter and... You know, we were oh, dude, struggling was, to pay. I couldn't dues. afford my, my dues. Yeah. Like I, I fully lied to myself about being able to pay those dues. Like, and we've talked about it so many times. It's, it's a scaling thing. Now you can't afford to pay for a warehouse or something, but it's like a scale, but you are able to manage it. But I remember those, I remember when we met and uh, it's crazy. Now with our dashboards, life's clear. We know who each other are. We know where we are. We can talk openly about struggles and successes and plans. We can plan now. Mm -hmm. you know, back then, we were just, we are running fast. And you know, we were running so fast and hard. But I think that's that part of the fun of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I love that, that struggle. The struggle's what makes me get it. I have, people always say, I mean, I don't really get off track, but you know, we come from a world where there's a, we go meet a lot of people and they're like, how are you set up for your retirement? How are you saving? Which you gotta see me, I'm a financial planner. And I think I've been retired since the day I started my business. You know, I get up every day like, this is awesome life. It's, I don't feel like I go to work. And I think I've got the reverse, like back then, I didn't, I didn't know. Like, I, I feel like I'm retired now. Everything, all those, it's I'm so taken care of because of how happy I am. And I think that's when people retire, they're always like, I'm gonna retire and be happy. I'm like, I'm totally happy now. All my boxes are being checked, life is good. And, you know, it's because we measure it. So we can see where it's going. That's amazing. And well, don't you feel that way sometimes? You know, it's funny. So for me, it's like I'm happy, 
But at the same time, there's a part of me that keeps wanting more. Oh, yeah, for and, sure. I'm driven. Yeah. And I mean, if you said, you know, is everything in your life going right? No. No. Um, and it never should. I, 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 but I love the struggle. I don't feel like work is work, just like you. Um, like, I get up, I'm charged. Like, I, I can work till god awful hours in the evening. I, I can wake up early in the morning, and I don't feel like it's a struggle at all. No. So, in that sense, yes, I'm happy. Um, it could be worse. I could be working for somebody and be absolutely miserable, not wanting to do anything. Um, you know, I was but, never unhappy working for other people either because I had, I was always lucky. Like if I worked in a restaurant, I worked for a guy, Sam Bonacici, and he's like, I'd be like, how'd you do that? He'd show me. Like, I'm curious. And I had great bosses. Um, sure, I didn't want to go to work if my friends were not, if they were partying or something. But I was never unhappy as an employee. I was always inspired by good leaders. And I always got the chance to work for cool entrepreneurs or else businesses that shared like their core values, vision and mission statement stuff that was like part of their culture. So I got, I got in and I was a service industry guy. Like, I mean, I've sat in factories and put handles on plastic buckets. I've pulled nails out of two by fours. I have no super skills. Like I'm not a, I never had a great job. Like, I never had a career path job. So, but they, the companies and people I worked around, they, we all just sort of stuck together, we made it happy. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I never have. I don't have regrets for my jobs. Uh, Let's see, my worst job, even power washing gutters, man, it was kind of fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's the thing is, is like I had jobs. Uh, I wouldn't say any of them were career oriented. All of it was customer service based, so not necessarily just service, but customer service based, generally. And I wasn't fortunate necessarily to have great bosses. I didn't have very many of them. Um, I had a couple that were that were good mentors. Um, on a on a strictly technical level, but then just real dick faces outside of that, um, and so it's it's nice to see like like somebody like you who you really do see the good side of so many things, and that's something that I really admire. Um, even when we were on leadership for BNI, I think that was uh, one of the things is you always found a way to go. Well, that might be on fire, but look at this; it's pretty. It's like it's doing really well, and I'm like, huh. That's an interesting mindset. I'm going to have to learn that one. And like, <laughs> well, I looked at you as totally different. I always thought you were like, you know, like I wanted to give you that jacket full of arrows. It's like you, nobody knows. They see you in the front, like, hey, there's Justin Lambert. His back is loaded with arrows. Like we took a, yeah, you take hits, good. You're good at, fo but you follow rules. Like you know, this is the direction we're going, the structure. This is the agenda. This is the plan. Here's the goal. Like you always attain your goals, but sometimes you change your plans. But you get to the goal. That's a good thing about you. It's like you hold things together. Mm, thanks. And well, yeah, you're man. You're solid. Cool. And so now, what's going to happen with where Phantom is going now? I mean, you you oh went from Phantom Couriers, but I know that you've been tinkering around with the logistics end of things, and that's like bigger than the the courier side of it. Like, what's, yeah. what's the future hold for you? Well, I always have. I've had so many false starts, right? Because. I often put the cart in front of the horse. It's like, oh yeah, I could do this. You know, I'm always really, I'm down. Like, what? You need this done? Let's do this. I mean, when we first re um, met sort of at uh, the BNI Big Tsunami, I think I'd just finished pulling off like uh, a bunch of flat deck trucks with iron bridges and four wheel drive forklifts up to Whistler. And I was like, I'm doing this again. I'm getting into the trucking, logistics, crazy, neat, cool stuff. And that totally failed, right? Because my partner, awesome dude, Family business, not so awesome. You know, like there's all these dynamics and it just, this is good, it just died. So I was like, oh, not again. But I never took my eye off the prize. Like, okay, I got the goal, keep changing the plan. It doesn't go this, doesn't go that. But lately, there's more opportunity, um, focused more on it, and I've got a better infrastructure for getting the things done. Like, uh, my partner companies that I'm working with are really excellent, they're no longer gonna be you know your dad and the son and that stuff. So they're much bigger, they're more robust, and we're moving some cool stuff. I've had opportunities. Some have panned out and some haven't, but a lot of good air freight going exporting. And now we've, and no, export is easy. Like, it's here in Vancouver, can you ship it? Yes, not a problem. Get it done. But import is always the hard thing. Like, how does tiny phantom couriers, small office, downtown Vancouver, limited staff, limited resources, limited cash flow, like everything's limited. How do you go and import a bunch of stuff from the United States with no infrastructure. And so we finally figured, just kept trying, like, oh, that's how it does? Listening to like commodities 
<laughs> jumping on commodities, uh, cat, uh, phone calls and talking to brokers and every, just getting involved and just, do you mind if we listen in on this uh, conversation? People were like, okay, yeah, for sure, conference calls. And we just got people like, why do you want to go on our conference call? And it's like, oh, well, because we've never done it. Oh, this, most people have done it. I went, I went to Industry Canada at an event at the Roundhouse and I told the lady, what, she's like, well, you can't do this because you haven't done this. I was like, I hate that. You can't be a plumber because you're not in the union. You're not in the union because you're not in a plumber. That's like the mindset of my youth. Mm -hmm. You're like, you can't work in the mill because you don't, not part of the union. I was like, what? It doesn't make sense. So it was exactly the same thing. So I was like, well, how do you, you get in? Well, you circumvent the gatekeeper. You talk to the people in the back and they invited us in on conference calls. And then they felt we'd follow up with questions. And then with those questions, we got relationships. And with those relationships, we've got, hey, you know, you guys were interested in this. We're handling all this massive mega stuff, but there's this small thing that's too small for us. Do you guys want to try it out and see if you learned anything? Yes, we do. Yes, please. Can we please do this? And so we did. And it worked. And it was like the hard, it was the creative weird way around it. And that's so amazing. I think the true entrepreneurship and the true driven person really just goes to execute. And yeah, go to I mean, execute. <laughs> and and that, that's the thing, though. I mean, I mean, you know me as a planner, um, and, and you're more of the just executor. Um, but the, the, and there's no fault to either or. It's, it's you really just fire and then aim. I kind of plan and then I kind of fire and then I readjust. Um, and I think a lot of people get paralyzed when, you know, the first door closes. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. Analysis paralysis, too. I've had great people work for me. Uh, Jeremy, this sweet dude, love him. Like best employee guy, but he's he's now working in government where things are so it's way better for him. He's like, I am here in this place and I'm doing what I love. But when he worked for me, he's like, I'm here in this place, I'm doing things I'm doing. I'm not sure I'm doing them right. Like he always, Jeremy, you're great, do it. And he's like, Am I? And it's like, Yes, am I? <laughs> it's like the paralysis, which is normal, right? And uh, with like you mentioned, the ready fire aim. It's like bracketing for photography, right? Remember back in the day of film, you're like, oh, I don't know if this is, I'm reading this right. We'll go on either side. If you got three, you're gonna get it. And so I like that. And I, a long time ago, a guy that owns a company called Tiramisu in Germany, he's like a econ last miler guy. He, Michael, he was working at Ballard Power. He told me, you've got to listen to this, this oh, CD. There were CDs, so I put them, I was like, okay, so I got my, Portable Walkman on the bus, headphones. It was ready, fire, aim. And I even have that in my email Yes, header. you have that as your email header. And people tell me to take it out. They're like, that's ridiculous. It means you're reckless. I'm like, I'm so reckless. What the heck? Why are you reading my email header? You know, you've known me for 20 years. Like, you know, it's just like my thing. I'll go do it. It's like, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I know that I run into closed doors all the time and then find out that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a pull door. Yeah. But at least I tried to open the door. That, and that's <laughs> the thing. I, I, it's, it's funny because I think people who don't execute it, don't have that mindset, always look at it the other way and they think of it as a negative. And I don't think, I mean, if you're going with pure intentions to learn something um, and you run into the brick wall like heavy, you learn something. And, and as long as you're not dumb to go back Should have jumped the, over the wall. Yeah, if you're not running through the brick door again and again and again and again doing the same thing, like that's insanity. But... If you're running the brick door, it goes, well, that clearly didn't work. Like, let's try this and let's try that and let's tweak it a little bit. Let's find another way around it. Let's research and let's just keep going. Um, with the end goal in mind, I think there's no, no fault in that. And actually, over the course of the long term, you'll get farther ahead than somebody who just says, oh, well, that didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, and man, if it's been done once, it's repeatable. Yeah, you know, I keep on seeing these little sayings all the time. And uh, one of them is, if it's humanly possible, it's possible by humans. So I'm a human, I can do it. So things like that. But you know, we end up repeating our mistakes. We end up going backwards in time. I think about a conversation with you and uh, the toxic culture of a company that just basically just nailed us into one place last year where we weren't moving. And because we were circling, I was just circling like, instead of moving forward, right? And it's like, there's just variables that affect business. You can be like all great with your planning and your dashboards as much as you want. But if you're, if you fail at any of those little duties, you have to keep your eye on like, why did I do that? Why am I allowing this to happen? How come I'm supporting these, these rules to be broken? 
Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, that conversation was interesting. Like I came in and I just sat there for what I was there for 15 minutes, maybe just looking at everything. And I said, you have problems. They're, they're glaring problems from an outside. I don't see them. Yeah. And you don't see, <laughs> and that's the thing is, it's like, I don't think people do see those things when they're this close to it. I mean, that's, a, that's why I brought it up. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's like in our business, it's the same. So when I know that I won't, I won't see everything when I'm this close. And so I have people that I rely on like yourself and you know, other people in, in my close circle who I think will give it to me straight and say, Hey, so I'm up against this problem and there's no shame in that because I think for me, it's like, you know, that fresh eyes are always good at it. And you know, for me to walk in and say, you need to adjust something. I know, look, adjust what? Are you kidding? We're the best we've ever been. And the problem was we were, we were climbing up. You know, everything was good, and but it wasn't as good as it could be. But you just you just get you get blind. You know, snow blind, business blind, can't see the forest for the trees. It's it's hard. So it's good to have a network, right? And I think that's what we've got. Both of us, bonus, we've got great networks. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, a friend of ours said, "Oh, you need Mike's network." And I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, great. I need Mike's network." And I missed the point. The guy's a smart guy who said that. He didn't mean you need Mike's network. He needs, you need a mic, like you need a network like Mike's. And so I was like, oh, instead of like, oh, reevaluating my network, I was looking at my network and being that you're part of it. And I've got an amazing network of cool people. I was like, ah, you know what? My network is awesome. Because you came over, you told me my problem. Three months later, after like, you know, squinting to see it, I was like, you know what? It's totally right. But it, it, as soon as you said it, it was there. It was like this until um, it was For like almost three months, right? Wasn't it? Everywhere I went, I was like, oh, what about that thing Justin Lamb mentioned? The toxic culture is going to sink your company. Isn't your company important? So important. But oh, I like avocados. And then it's like, I have to do something about this. And it was, it was hard. I had to go see labor people and all stuff. I could tap my head for three months because really I'm used to it. And I felt that. And then when I'm, when I pulled out that first card of that house of cards and it nothing happened and then it went pow, I was like, thank God. And then I rebuilt it. And the first rebuild was almost perfect. And now, you know, I've got so much more freedom to do creative things. It was, you know, you hear that competitive mind and creative minds. Like I love the creative mind. It's just a place to be. It's fun. But my, I'd go to work and be like, hi, everybody. Start to be competitive. I'd have to compete against the employees. It would put you into like this unfun state. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, everybody would go home. And it was so hard. It was like I told you. It felt like Evil Knievel racing down the ramp until 5 o'clock. And then at 5 o'clock, launch off the ramp to nothing. Yep. Like, no jump, no nothing. It was just like a day. It was like the Groundhog Day of crap. Mm -hmm. But getting work done. But the hardest way possible ever. Like the hardest way and losing lots of money too with mistakes. Yeah. That was killing us. Like you saw the wall and I had that new employee, Haley, who thought it was fun to put things up there because she was brand new. We didn't tell her. It's like, Haley, quick, put that up on the wall. And the wall was coded. It was like $30,000 and fail. And she's like, can I reach the top? I was like, I don't know. Can you jump that high? <laughs> like <laughs> she thought it was so great until I told her what it really was. Haley, those are all fails. What do you mean fails? Like we're refunding the money, the customer's not happy. We totally let down an excellent customer. She's like, wow, you know, but that was, we had to have a giant, like the elephant was invisible until we covered it in paper. And there was this giant 20 foot by 20 foot wall. And it's interesting. That was, that was such a week, a month. That was such a month. Cause it was peeling. It was like, you can't hide because you can't hide anymore. Oh, and by the way, would you mind just putting your name up there? Cause in a month when we review all this, we will ask questions like, how did we allow this to happen? Why did we not find it out? And systems and procedures that weren't being done that just got more robust. I remember when uh, Dion joined the team and Dion and Haley pulled everything down and had it into stacks. I got them here. I don't want to dig them up because they're so painful. But the title pages they put on all of them, were ridiculous. But they were like no holds barred, not just like, oh, accounting error. It was like, don't know what the F you were doing. Lied to yourself. It was like, excellent. Yeah. And yeah. Oh man. And, and let, let's, let's back that into culture then. Um, so when, when I first came, I, I saw that there was toxicity in the system and when yeah, it starts here though, it starts right here at the top, you know, well, like allowing it. we take ownership and, and, and ownership is not necessarily that you 
breed it, but you foster it because yeah, totally. you're not willing because you you fear what happens when you get rid of your top tier person, the person who's been like the crux of your system, um, and and when they're the backbone of your system and you've relied on them for so many years, peeling away the bandaid is extremely hard. But let's 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 say. What was the mental journey when I told you to, or when I suggested that you do something like that, um, and then how much it propelled you forward? Can we maybe talk about like that pain point when I said, like, you need to kind of do something because you're going to lose a chunk, or you're already losing a chunk load of money, yeah. and that you can propel and leap forward. Like, what was that transition? It was a across the board transition, like. Everything had to change. Everything changed. Like I was in a 10-year relationship where we lived together. We don't live together anymore. Uh, I was smoking cigars and drinking scotch all the time. Um, so I haven't had any scotches since September 28th. Unfortunately, as I look across to my giant scotch collection, I don't miss it. But it was just these habits. Um, you know, my body was... I was at the end of my rope because I was... Uh, every day I was just at, just start and end at the end of your rope, mm -hmm. but still enjoying my job. Like I didn't yeah. have a problem getting up. It's like, get up, go, okay, uh, open door, bad. But like there was enough left to make the, you want to continue with walking forward, like no depression or like whatever. But uh, just, it was just like, it was such a short journey, like great, bad, right? It was just like, what the hell is this going to be? You were really stressed during that time. I was stressed, and it was, I was having no fun, and there was fails, and I, okay, when I was lying to myself, everything's groovy, right? Like, yeah, come home, cigars, sit outside, YouTube videos, headphones, listen, you know, whatever, live in a beautiful city, got a beautiful girlfriend, who cares? But then, uh, when you came over that night, it didn't take much, right? You can see how vulnerable it was. It's like, okay, Mark, because I'm just like gathering that shit around myself, and it's pathetic, and I know better. And I've had such great influencers in my life that are like, do this. But I was trying so hard to keep everybody else like, oh, if I just keep you up, you'll be good. Let it all dust out. The good moment that you came over, right? I was like, of course, thinking about it all the time, finger in the forehead. I went to Terminal City Club one morning. My fob wasn't working. and I couldn't get my parking and I had to take the long way around and I was getting mad. It's like, Mark. Like, that's not a thing you would usually, that's not something that would usually trip me up, you know? Oh, fob doesn't work. Great. I get more time to walk. I don't know. It's like, it doesn't really, but I was like, what the frick? It must be my fault. I'm such a loser. And I came upstairs and there was this guy, Paul Alvarez. And he was standing there with a cup of coffee and he had a yin and yang t-shirt on. Like his logo is yin and yang. And I said, hey, how's it going? And he's like, hey, do you remember me? And I was like, no, of course again, you know, because I'm just so overwhelmed. And he's like, it's me, Paul Alvarez. I worked with your buddy Jeff. I was like, oh, that's right. He's like, I started up my own company. I was like, oh. And I looked at his logo. I was like, I love your logo. It reminds me of like TNC Skate Company back in the day, like this yin and yang. And I was thinking about it. I was like, I have a yin and yang tattoo from a friend of mine that got murdered. And I remember me and Steve, like, always talking about being the line in between. Like, that's a great place to be. You got the, both worlds. You can live in these worlds. I was like, I kind of miss, like, I missed my tattoo, I miss Steve, I miss skateboarding. I was looking at Paul Alvarez, and he was so, like, chill and young businessman, coffee. I was like, and uh, I was like, well, it's, you know, every word he said seemed to be like, so how could this young guy be so sage-like? And then Pax shows up from Restore Human, and he's like, super clapping, saying, hey, Mark, it's good to see you. And I was like, oh, yeah. So I got just you. I got you. I got Pax. I got Paul. And they're all saying, like, all these sort of things about old Mark. And they're like, and Pax is like, oh, man, you know, I was driving through Mexico, listening to those audiobooks you re uh, recommended, going to see my sister. I was like, wow, I have not driven through the Mexican desert listening to anything, having a good time. And I was like, but you should be. And he's like, what's wrong? I was like, what do you mean what's wrong? He's like, what's wrong with you? I was like, huh? And he's like, you need to come and hyperventilate with me. And I was like... Well, that's the weirdest offer to do anything anywhere. It's like, we need to go for lunch or, you know, come to my house and have dinner with my family, but you need to hyperventilate. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, well, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So of course I'll do this. But it was like, all these people were starting to look at me and I was like, okay, it was reevaluation day. And uh, I just took all the advice from you and from Paul and from Pax and just started out on a new path and started like putting new verticals together. 
And since that day, I've been super stoked, super happy, super good. My dashboards, I might have just been adding the numbers before and not paying attention to them, right? So that's a super important thing. And so when you were doing that, and then I just started to reevaluate things, and if it was good, it was good. If it was bad, it needed to be like edited and you know, or eradicated. I always go back to like, there's this tool song where they're like, they're gonna eradicate this guy, like any cockroach or anything. I was like, your problems that you create, they're just like, if you saw like a evil bug in your house, you wanna catch it and throw it outside. I was letting evil bugs just live safely under glasses all over the place. Like my mental, you know, conundrum of my mind when I was looking around, I was like, well, that's okay, that spider's not getting out, but it is deadly. And there's deadly time, or this grenade, you know, <laughs> the pins out. It was like I had a lot, of, I had set up a lot of fails along the way. Eliminated them, which made it good for new employees coming in. I'd be like, here, why don't you read this employee's manual, which we revamped, got that all going. It, our old one was good, but now it's even better. Just all those fun processes started going again, and then that just went. You know, Sheree and I don't live together. Now I go to her house and have dinner all the time and we see each other and it's more fun. Like it was just all this mark disaster. I was holding way too much. Now I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna <laughs> spread it all out in my mental mind and go do fun things, one thing at a time and processing my life back to normal. It's been, uh, it's awesome. And you know, I like, still, I've got, I've, you know, I always got up really early and like to be accountable for that 4 a.m. thing. Even that slipped. Mm. And I was like, 6 a.m. wake up. I was like, fuck. Oh, I don't know if I can swear. But I mean, I have a tattoo across my chest printed backwards so I can read it in the mirror. And that was another like fail lie. It's like, oh, that's like that guy that gets vegan on his arms eating a hot dog at the baseball game. It's like, dude, fail. So I was like, okay, you know what? Failure's part of life. We're all gonna fail. So I unfailed and checked myself. And then, you know, things are good. And I'm way happier going forward. And every time I'm in a situation, it's like, I know what the answer is right now. If, if this is the wrong answer, we're gonna find the right one. It's like, we got this excellent momentum. And so when we're bringing it back into the business, now we're getting these great opportunities. The opportunities are we're able to handle them. And we're not so gonna do it right away. It's gonna, this is gonna happen. And we just sort of tick them off and things are going. And those verticals are scaling. I had, I've got a big eight foot like cork board behind my desk and I had all my verticals. And so a couple weeks ago, I printed out all my business plan templates and I put the things I wanted to work out and I put them up there. And this week, one of my things was take down business plan and start working on it. So I brought one home this week. I was like, well, you better get to it. And then I heard this morning, I've mentioned it to you about Hemingway 39 times rewriting his book. And I was like, that's just like your business plan. Have you rewritten your business plan lately? Cause I'm not Mark Huggin from August. And my company is not Phantom Couriers from September. It's like, we're not even the same companies we were last week. Same things, we do the same things, but we're so much better. We constantly improve every day. And it's like this painting, it's amazing. Yeah. So right now it's like the best. I've all, I remember once a long time ago, I met this photographer in Whistler and he was a cool guy and he came downtown and we were at the Love Affair night, nightclub and just everybody's like raging around. And I remember this like weird moment like he's this cowboy weirdo, cool artist dude. He comes up, he's like, grabs me. He's like, you're so existential. I don't even know what you mean, right? <laughs> and so I kind of like live for like right now. And that's what it feels like at work. It's like we're in a freedom flow. It's a flow state of business. And it might sound hippie, but I'm going to ride it out because I'm having a really good time. Yeah. Like I'm so fun into myself now. I'm having such a good time waking up, just feeling good. And I know it's a lifetime of practice, right? Just like whatever, up and down. It's not the thing that started in with Pax and Paul, that was just me identifying, hey, Pax and Paul and Justin, you guys are the guys I need to pay attention to. Wake up, get out of your you know, fugue state and roll. And you've done it before. And every time you do it, you become more resilient. And I think that's what entrepreneurs are all about. Like, I seriously, I remember another time seeing you and you were in a bad mood and you didn't know it. I saw you downtown, you had your crew and you were going somewhere and I was like, oh, that guy's a hard ass. Didn't even say hi. And then, you know, later you're like, I'm busy. I don't even know what I'm doing. Like we get into these like, hi, bye. I don't even know what I'm doing. Blindness. It's like, ooh, like we don't know because we're so, we're powerful little people running little companies and paying payrolls. Even, even the smallest started today entrepreneur is a powerful person. You know, that takes balls. It's hard. And most likely you'll fail and then instantly start again. Like, I mean, I have had so many 
mega fails that just didn't mean anything. Oh, it's terrible. I'm broke. The government wants to kill me. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, put key and door, open door, go to work next day. It's like, we're just, we're crazy. Like, I don't understand. Yeah, entrepreneurship. Yeah, like, resilience. It's, and I think for people who are just sort of dipping their toes in entrepreneurship, that's a good litmus test is when the going gets tough, do you crumple or do you just... You don't even know it's that tough. Yeah. That's why you get worn out. Mm -hmm. But then your network can save you. So, But when you're worn out, you will let your guard down. And that's when not everybody who works for you has got your back. Like, you can't expect that because they're just normal people. They want to come to work and have a job and go home and be with their family and do their things they love. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that they're there to serve you. Mm -hmm. And if you misread things, that's your problem. You should know that people want to come to work and do their thing and go home. And you should be, what do you like to do when you go home? And support that. Because if you don't, you're just going to end up unsupporting them. And then they're just going to become unfulfilled. And then that's you. That's you as the boss making that environment for them to work in that affects your business. It's, you cannot blame them. It's how you mismanage your leadership. All, what did I write down today? Something about... Every problem is a leadership problem. I don't know why I wrote that down. It's like, because I hear it all the time, well, but it is, it is true. I mean, it's 100% true. You think true. about it, when we took over um, leadership role at our chapter, I mean, it was, it was in shambles. I mean, it was hurtling down words and people were just getting really grouchy and whatnot. Oh, yeah, and, there was a lot of change. The last leadership team was uh, unsupported with all their change, mm -hmm. which meant, like, we're the leadership team here, they were the leadership team here, the ones that were telling them to do all change, that came from like a leadership position. They're like, would you mind just doing all this? We're not going to show you how to do it. And they're like, I don't know how to do it. And then the talk, clock runs out and they're like, hey, Justin and Mark, and would you mind doing this? And Joel, would you mind doing this? Sure. And then suddenly there's a huge gap and we know what happens with a vacuum or a gap. It gets filled with whatever you think mm -hmm. is going to fit in there. And that's not usually what is proper. Yeah. So yeah, that was, a, that was a learning thing. It burnt me out. I hated it. <laughs> like, we but we, we did good. I mean, like well, yeah, we, we we turned it around. Mm -hmm. we, like we put a lot of effort. We we waded through a lot of shit. But at the end of the day, like we we rallied together. We had each other's backs, and you know we had direction. We want we knew what we wanted, um, and we knew the type of people we wanted. And and I think we did. We did well. We, we knew our goal work. was to hand over a buttoned up leadership team for the next team. That was our goal. Our goal wasn't to like make every week a beautiful, great week and to make the, the financial goal. Our goal was to fix like where the holes were to let everybody know like, hey, there's a hole here. Why don't you stand where there is no hole while we figure things out? Like maybe you should not stand where the hole is. Stand over here where it's good structure. Quit looking at the stupid hole because that's going to be edited out. And we only, we started to like edit out the problems and we, showed people where to go where it was good and safe. And we handed it over and we had that test with the uh, finances. And it's like, calm down, right? Would you just calm down and look? Because we, we use the, the words, well, when you take over the transition, there's gonna be like this cash flow surge that comes, it's like a tide. And then there was the instance where they were like, this is freak ah, freaked out. And it's like, calm down. We have the paperwork to back it up. And we did, and we showed it and it was, gone like that so that with that being said I think that's our that's where our leadership was always gonna go was to get this thing steady and hand it over so you can do with it what you will but you had a good foundation you know like because everything that you learn and talk about is always about structure mm -hmm. and so there's no way you were gonna be in charge of anything and be like yeah I'm just gonna get this balance of this for a year and then you know hand it to you it was like no I got this I got this, right? I got this. And it was like, you hand it over like, I got you. So it's good. And we learned that from the last 20 plus years of being in business. Yeah. You know, Justin Lamb, camera around his neck. I think this thing's uh, going to make money and have a wife and a kid <laughs> with this camera. Like, said no one smart ever. But passionate people say it all the time. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, got to put food on the table. How much food was a variable, right? <laughs> <laughs> some, 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 some months, days, and years are very little food, 
<laughs> Sometimes you wouldn't eat. You just let everybody else at the table eat. But uh, I had croutons and dressing once. <laughs> like, I, told you, I didn't get I the like, dressing. I just got the croutons, Mark. <laughs> it is late. And I'm, it was just one of those days I came home. It was like, whatever. I used to cycle a lot back and forth to work. And I was living in uh, Ackroyd Road in Richmond in an apartment where my mom thought it was a crime scene because the company had failed hard. Like, it was terrible. And I had to regroup. And I came home super late, and I was like, oh, does he eat? And I was like, oh, everything seems to be missing, because I didn't buy anything. It's like <laughs> dressing in croutons. I just remember like, yeah, this is it, man. Next day, I went and bought some groceries. It wasn't like I was broke, but I had not prepared. It was just an entrepreneurial fun afternoon, you know, it's just disasters. Well, it's mental. Uh, so generally, I ask uh, my guests to recommend a resource or whatever that has been helpful for them, uh, either a book, a website, whatever, um, what type of resource would you recommend people to dive into? The, you know, I love reading books and like everybody knows I like to read. It's a thing I always talk about, but I guess with technology lately, I've been really loving my Audible account. And I know I can, you know, read like the, it's like, oh, I'll just do it again and again and again. And, you know, I was listening to You Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins for the second time the other day. And I went out and did one of his, like, 48 miles in 48 hours challenges last week. And uh, just listening to the audiobook, I get up in the morning, you know, I get my little running cell phone holder, put it on, headphones on, make some coffee, do whatever I'm going to do, work out or whatever in the morning. And I've been listening to those, uh, those things and just getting in my head. I'm, my resource is me. So I get up with a plan to be right on point of learning and feeling good. Like he, in the last one in that, you can't hurt me. I'm sure some people have heard it and some haven't. He has these challenges where he's like, go back in time and find out what bugs you and address it. And things always bug us. And it might be, you forget about the thing that bugged you when you were little. Maybe it was the thing that bugged you yesterday. But I was like, yeah, those little things that are bugging me lately, like I won't allow the toxicity to start. You know, I cut myself, I better clean the wound. So it's not going to get infected. So if I'm, I'm more resilient now due to that. And uh, just, I think I'm lucky. I'm super lucky to be able to now understand and absorb things that I'm learning. But my network shows me the path all the time. Like I was talking to Carrie Rendak last night and she said that, you know, with this coronavirus and Australia burning and the, the pipeline protest disruption and the whole economy and the United States shutting the borders and all these weird things that are happening to the economy. She said that she saw, because she has privy to all closed Facebook groups. So all the chatter amongst the people, the network that we belong to, the culture and the, all around the world is all these people reaching out to support each other. And I was like, that's where it comes from. Like, you know, that's the golden rule. Our big thing, you know, you know that book, uh, Think and Grow Rich? Mm -hmm. And this, so HR, the lead singer of the, like a thrash, a hardcore punk band, Bad Brains, one of my favorite bands, it's just like, it's like this reggae hardcore guy. And he's like a god, HR is like a god. But he made everybody read that book. And I remember reading the book because I read like in a zine, the thing, and I went and found the book because HR is a god. And then when I got into our B&I thing, they're like, yeah, the golden rule and Tuttle, that Chicago mayor, it's like, we will not do anything unless it benefits other people. And givers gain and golden rule. I think that, that our culture of friends around us, our community, is excellent. And I think that's probably my, I would recommend to everybody to look at their group of friends and, and get supported from them, because they're there to support you. Because friends support friends, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Even criminals. So like, Joey, we're gonna knock over the truck tonight. How are we gonna do it, Hank? I don't even know. Joey, let me show you. I've done this a million times. You did it wrong last time. You ran over your foot. Even the criminals have friends that'll show them the way, right? Like if you just line up your, like your mind and just go with your friends because that moment outside standing beside my new car when you said that to me, I was like, duh. <laughs> it was like, I remember walking up the stairs like every step. Did he just say to me, I'm the best I've ever been? Wrong! Because <laughs> you saw me outside and I'm like, hmm, smart move, right? So, do you want to ask me? I think it's guys like you and all my friends around that I see all the time who drop golden nuggets. Like Dean Robertson, 
The guy can't walk by you without dropping a golden nugget of like wisdom on the floor. If you don't pick it up, you're a dummy. Pick it up. What did he just say? What does he mean by that too, right? Gotta call him. What did you mean by that? Because it might be a crazy, arty way of saying something. Like Confucianism. Yeah. <laughs> so you like say something, you're like, oh my God, that's so deep. And you have to really mull on it. <laughs> yeah, like he... And when you're sitting on the shitter is when you figure it out. <laughs> yeah. He hooked me, he looked me up the other day because a guy was door to door salesman, came to his house and he was autistic and he was trying to do aeration of the lawn. And Dean's like, you need to meet Mark Huggin. So Dean's out in Langley. This guy's like a door to door salesman and he thinks of me because Dean's put out things that I really like and I guess I've said things that Dean really liked. So that's a great symbiotic relationship with a mentor style person. So if I look at him like a mentor and he looks at me like a mentor, we're in a good place. And if Dean calls me to help some guy out in Langley because he thinks I can help him, I'm so in a good place. I'm so grateful. So gratitude, friends, network, all the good stuff that's going on these days. It, it's, it's a crazy good world, you know? And it's a bright sunny day. I mean, we're lucky guys. I know. It's going to be so awesome. I'm going to go. I have a wedding today. So. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you very Terrifying. much. Terrifying. If any of you guys found value in today's podcast, um, or if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, please like, subscribe. It really helps with the algorithm, helps spread the news, and I really appreciate you guys being here. Have a great day, make it awesome, and we will talk to you next time.